But maybe we could shift the conversation a little bit and, and help people to see whether or not they're actually narcissists. Some of those narcissistic patterns of behavior or desires in their hearts by talking a little bit about your work on the Enneagram. Now, not everybody listening to this is going to be familiar with the Enneagram, so don't turn it off. This the, You're going to get something out of this, whether or not you can say what number on the Enneagram uh, you personally are, because what you're describing in, in this, again, is, is kind of a, a full or rounded out experience of how different kinds of people experience uh, narcissism. So I would love to start with um, what, what you talk about um, as as people whose uh, sinful dysfunction is often uh, powered by a deep sense of shame. So on the Enneagram, these are twos, threes, and fours. Um, so how do people driven by shame in particular experience narcissism? Yeah, that's such a good question. So, um, you know, I, I think that every, every Enneagram type um, is... Uh, is dealing with sort of unmetabolized shame in yeah. a sense, right? Um, when when they're functioning in unhealth. Um, but there is this sort of unique manifestation within the twos, threes, and fours, where we do tend to kind of bring our deep questions about ourselves to others in relationship, right? In a way that, you know, five, six, and sevens as head types um, go to information and, and intellectual resourcing. Um, I and, and so as we bring these, these deep questions to one another, um, there is this sense that we're asking one another to sort of um, fix us, you know, um, to address our shame. Like when I got married um, 28 years ago, there was a sense, I didn't know it at the time. And I, I didn't have a good enough pre-marriage uh, ca- counseling pastor to tell me, but like, Chuck, you're bringing deep questions of your soul to Sarah and asking her to address them. And a lot of that was a deep sense of shame and security that we see in twos, threes, and fours manifesting in this kind of um, uh, relational voraciousness, like um, Mm. gimme, 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 feed me, um, meet this need, fill the void, right? And so I think one of the ways that, one of the ways that this conversation is helpful You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that uh, too often our confession of sin is general. In other words, it's like, I'm just a sinner, big old (laughs) sinner, you know, versus what what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say, hey, talk about sin. I think psychological language can be helpful and the different manifestations of it, like the unique manifestation of the sin of the two, you know, and giving to get. Um, it, well, that's revelatory if you're a two, you know, yes. so you might not be as grandiose. You may not need the stage like a three might need the stage or an eight might need the stage. But in your activism or in your helping, there is this kind of raciousness. Feed me, feed me, meet, meet my, you know, reflect back to me, um, uh, my, you know, uh, something that will fill my sense of void or deficiency. Yeah. So a sense of I will serve, I will give. Uh, but I have all of these expectations. Someone once called expectations uh, uh, unspoken demands from you yeah. in return for for the service that I've delivered. I need to be yeah. celebrated by you. I need to uh, yeah. you know be known as a certain kind of person. Um, and and yeah. you, you already said that's also present in, in threes and fours. I, I am I am either a three wing four or a four wing three. I think it kind of depends on the, the day. I feel like I'm so 50 <laughs> 50 on yeah, the both of them. I hear you. But 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 what you described there about about this constant voracious need to be fed by relationships is so mm-hmm. true. David Foster Wallace had this phrase to describe his depression. He called it a black hole with teeth. And it stuck with me for a long time because I, I can't I can't quite articulate why it's right, but it's exactly what you just said. In my most unhealthy moments, I'm a black hole that just wants to suck in all of the light of praise and you're great and you're amazing and and aren't you special and aren't you different if I'm in a form <laughs> and yeah. all of those things. But you know, a black hole doesn't does doesn't actually it devours the light, right? It crushes the yeah. light. The light I don't know what happens to black holes, but in my mind it ceases to yeah. exist. And so there's never enough. You can't ever fill up. A black yeah. hole, and, and, and so that's how the narcissism, you know, those narcissistic tendencies, at least in me, end up getting expressed. Is 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 trying to, with my false self, draw in the light of that praise and adoration and that individuality. Right. W- would you say yeah. anything else to, to threes and fours? You kind of mentioned twos. Yeah, well, you know, th- threes are often sort of uh, they're put out there as sort of a prototypical. Uh, narcissist right yes um poor, poor threes they they sort of get a bad rap right 
Um, well, there here's is... the thing with threes. Everybody, like, they, they get a bad rap, but everybody wants to be a three. Everyone it, wants in, to in be a three. In American culture, I, th- I think that, uh, yeah, three yeah. or a seven, those are two of the most ideal personality types. So I always talk to people yeah. who be like, oh, yeah, I'm I'm definitely a three. And it's kind of funny because I know and be like, hey, I'm, I, I'm not sure you are. Also, like, I don't think you uh, want... want whatever type you are in the Enneagram, you don't want to be like, you would desperately just I say, so. I, w- right. I don't want that. And like when I yeah. look at threes, I'm like, good gosh, please. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, sorry. Yeah. Keep, keep going. What would you say? Yeah, to them? no, I mean, and in a sense, they do fit sometimes that more classic sort of grandiose narcissism, mm-hmm. right? They, they are more performative. They do like the stage. The fours don't fit that grandiose narcissism quite as much. Um, I would identify as a four wing three and there is this sort of smug superiority. Mm-hmm. Uh, fours can be emotionally manipulative, right? And there is this um, desperate need to be seen as special. And so, um, you know, each one of those types, twos, threes, and fours have their own unique ways of getting their needs met. Um, the the four will be it, do it in a more passive aggressive and backhanded way than the three though. <laughs> mm. But deep down the driver is, like you said, uh, a sense of shame or, uh, I'm yeah. not enough. I'm worthless. And I'm I'm hoping, I'm praying that you, whether it's your wife or your boss or your friends yeah. or the people on Twitter, that you would just say something that proves that that deep down thing isn't true. And of course, the false self is out there to get people to say the things to you yeah. that you want, which can become so narcissistic. Yeah. 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 I would. I would. Yeah, that's it. Well said. So let's let's move on to five, six, and seven. Uh, you, you talk about these as people who are in the anxiety triad or the head triad. So, yeah. so they're driven a lot by anxiety. So, so, so how do people driven by anxiety experience narcissism? Yeah, I think I think if I go back and have a do over, I would have talked about it as unmetabolized shame that leads to a, a kind of buzzing anxiety within um, amidst mm. a deep sense of insecurity. Like, and so if, if an un, unmetabolized shame in twos, threes, and fours leads to this kind of relational voraciousness um, for five, sixes, and sevens, it leads to this kind of uh, deep sense of insecurity and um, anxiety about the world. And they go up into their heads to, um, to, to, for some sense of control in the midst of their anxiety, like it gives them some sense of, uh, of I'm okay up here, you know? And so I've worked with a lot of fives over the years who found their way to their room, to the closet in their room, you know, maybe at like seven years old, they were reading Tolkien by flashlight, you know, but it felt safe. And inevitably, uh, or often I should say, maybe not inevitably, there's some sense that I was protecting myself from the drama or the pain or whatever was going on around me, right? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, sixes organize their world, uh, in and through rules, right? They, they sort of, they learned, um, what am I supposed to do? You know? So they became, I call them Hawkeyes sometimes. This is the Jason Bourne of the Enneagram types. Um, they walk into the room and they see everything that could possibly go wrong. Yeah. Right. Um, to maintain some sense of control. Whereas in a really interesting way, the sevens, they go up into their heads, uh, by becoming sort of optimistic visionaries. And this is, by the way, Claudio Naranjo, an early sort of Enneagram founder, uh, uh, sage called the sevens, the, uh, the kind of classic, uh, narcissist, right? Because this is the disconnected, uh, visionary, uh, at his worst, uh, with a kind of brooding anger, but sort of always living in the future, always living for what's next. Yeah. Yeah, so if if I'm understanding you correctly, people in this triad, like you said, they they have the same unmetabolized shame as a, a lot of as everybody else <laughs> does, yeah. uh, but it's expressed or it's it's protected in some ways through anxiety, which is then expressed yeah. through a desire to control. We we had Bob Goff yeah. on the show, and he says he's in yeah. Enneagram Seven, and you know he made this comment it just shows like how different people are because it made no sense to me but you know he he said that when he feels like little bob like 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 kid version of bob and he's insecure his response is i've got to make things fun like that's the way he can control the situation and 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 kind of uh deal with his anxieties i just got to make things fun and i thought that is so weird you know that makes no sense to me but it's because he's so different (laughs) than i am so absolutely (laughs) 
so 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 that again yeah. it's 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 just a fascinating thing I, i'd love yeah. to, to to talk about fives one more time because um fives are yeah. a personality type that i've often found i have a difficult time understanding it's just totally selfish yeah what what, what how do they I, I know six as well because um my wife is a six and i spend a lot of time uh, with sixes yeah. honestly sixes kind of make me feel safe so <laughs> because they are so hawkeye like it's easy if you're a three yeah. and you have insecurities you go find yourself a six and they make sure that everything yeah. stays you know kind of safe and steady but but how do fives express this yeah it sort of is the intellectual know-it-all right mm. um they go up into their heads and they they gain a sort of a mastery over uh whatever particular topic let's say in the you know in, in our world uh over their theology right and um and and they operate with a kind of uh superiority and a condescension amidst that right so whenever you see a tendency toward narcissism um, there's a lack of humility and a, and a kind of self-righteousness that appears, right? But this self-righteousness is around, I, I know more than you. And, and my experience of fives, and, and I've read this before too, is that they've got big eyes, they see everything, you know, they, they've got kind of that all-knowing kind of glare. Uh, I sometimes feel, because I'm a four that can feel really teeny tiny sometimes, you know, in the presence of a, a really smart five, I can feel really small, yeah. like, I know what... I'm doing right now. I don't know what I'm talking about compared <laughs> to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that That's interesting. But in all these cases, those would in some senses be expressions of the false self, sinful expression. We have yeah. this deep down shame because we've, you know, broken our relationship with God. We've sinned against him and we yeah. feel uh, disconnected from him. And again, what I love here is that we're saying, look, that, that, that can create shame, which then is covered up with anxiety and fear, which is then yeah. kind of covered up with this desire to control. And I can control it with yeah. how much I know or with how much I'm able to yeah. kind of keep all the puzzle pieces together, or how much fun I can have. This is really yeah. helpful for me as I'm thinking about people yeah. and just showing grace to people who are different than me, yeah. because it's always easier to see this in someone else <laughs> than it is to, to see it in yourself. Yeah. Yeah, our, our relational violations of, of one another show up in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I think that, um, you know, uh, so we didn't talk about nines yet. Maybe we will, right? But like, yeah, nines, let's go there. Let's, uh, let's do eight nines and one. So people who are yeah. driven by anger and, and how do they experience narcissism? Yeah, I mean, there is a kind of, in the, in the midst of their unmetabolized shame, there is a kind of fortress wall that goes up for, I think, eights, nines, and ones, a self-protective wall. Um, that distances them uh, from others. And and I do think that, you know, uh, when we talk about nines, nines are always, oh, nines, they're so nice. They're so kind, you know. Um, but I do think that in the same way, there is this kind of wall that goes up. They operate through a kind of, let's keep everything good. Let's keep the peace, right? Yeah. Um, in a way that um, that doesn't invite relationship, doesn't in, invite connection, um, but keeps them safe, right? And so uh, nines need to sort of reckon with the way that they keep keep themselves safe and they keep others at a distance. And there can be, and what I've seen in unhealthy nines on the kind of narcissistic spectrum, there can be a kind of quiet rage that builds up. Uh, I think it's uh, Suzanne Stabile that talks about they store arrows in their quiver. Um, maybe it's Marilyn Vansel, but whoever it is, they store arrows in their quiver and, and they're just sort of waiting to, my wife is a nine. My wife is the kindest, gentlest person I know, but on occasion there can be just a little like poke, you know, that's like, <laughs> Oh, where has that been for the last two years? You know? Yeah. And, so, but they can also passive aggressively shut you out. And there's a power in that, you know, that nines have where it's just kind of like, I'm not going to show up like the eight. I'm not going to get aggressive. No, I'm not going to challenge. Uh, I was just talking to a buddy of mine who's an eight. He says, I shadow box every day with people that I can fight in my head. You know, like I, I'm fighting with people in my head, yeah. even if I'm not fighting with people in real life. Um, nines don't fight with people uh, in real life, right? But there, there is a kind of fight within. Um, ones, you know, their narcissistic superiority looks at like a perfectionism of uh, a desire to perfect others. Uh, which, of course, with their unmetabolized shame, uh, uh, also needs to reckon with their own sense of of uh, of shame, right? Their own insecurity, their own lack of worth, right? And so, uh, where where I've seen the, I, well, ha having been in uh, Reformed Presbyterian circles, I've seen a lot of one energy show up in this kind of lawyerly, self righteous. You know, this yeah. this is the way God would ha would would have it, right? Um, with a kind of superiority. 
Oh, that's that's so interesting. Yeah, and I think you're right because the uh, narcissism of of eights is often the most visible of the the three in some ways because they can be challengers and they can come across as angry or frustrated and controlling. Um, and again, probably next up would be ones who can come across also as controlling or as self righteous or as you know I, I've I've got the answers. And nines, like you said, are are often difficult to to be around. But you know, even in my own experience, you know, a, a narcissistic nine. I'm not saying someone who has narcissism, but that has those tendencies. In some ways, can be one of the most difficult personalities uh, to respond to because on the surface they seem so peaceable. Uh, but yeah. underneath, they're roiling, and when that when that roiling anger comes yeah. out, um, yeah. it can be used to uh, whip other people into you know obedience in shocking ways. Uh, and so that's again, that's what I appreciate about this whole thing is is that it, on the one hand, it helps when we have eyes to see uh, narcissistic behaviors in other people. And my my broader hope here is that if you're listening to this, you saw yourself in some of these things. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, man, yeah. I have some of those narcissistic patterns of behavior that I need to maybe start resolving and thinking through, but maybe even dig it down a layer and say, what's driving me? What's motivating me? Going down even a dare a layer deeper and saying, Hey, what is that deep shame and insecurity I have, you know, and, and going down a deep layer and seeing the, the, the theological undergirding of that, which is, you know, I've, I've sinned against a, a holy God and that's created a rupture in relationship that has this, um, kind of fragmenting, fractalizing effect in every dimension of my life. Um, that, that, that is a really powerful tool in my opinion, just for self-reflection and for hopefully finding healing. So what, what would you yep. say to that, to that though, to the person who's, who's hearing themselves in one of these personalities or a few of them, how do you seek healing? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's important to recognize in all of this, that it's not just sort of a one, sometimes when we talk about sin, we, we think about it as a one-off behavior yeah. rather than, uh, taking it, uh, with a, with a, a, a more deadly seriousness, you might say, with a, um, a a greater sobriety, as if to say, no, it's more, it manifests more in a relational style um, uh, that, that of course, then manifests in w- one-off ways that we hurt one another, right? But if we don't look at our relational style, um, we miss an opportunity for that deeper healing that you were talking about, right? And so when I've gone into churches and done this work with pastors, for instance, um, they, they'll, you know, they'll be quick to say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was in that meeting, I spoke over her. I, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Um, mm. you know, with, with a lot of anxiety, like just wanting to get through it. And I'll, I'll want to say, Hey, let's just step back and, and ask the question. Is there a pattern here? Is there a relational pattern that shows up where you, you have this tendency maybe to talk over people in a, in a variety of different ways. Right. And, uh, you're always operating out of a kind of anxiety that leads you to, uh, shut others down. That's when the conversation gets to me more interesting, um, more vulnerable. Uh, I, I think that's where, as Bonhoeffer might say, confession becomes more specific mm. and where there's this sense that, that, that the person doing the work on themselves, um, uh, engaging a, what, what uh, Christianity has classically called self-examination, where there's this kind of um, humility that grows like, oh, the rabbit hole goes deeper than I thought it did. And there's stuff that I need to look at that, wow, this, and I can sort of even trace this back to ways in which I began to show up in seventh, eighth, ninth grade, you know, amidst all the drama that was going on with mom and dad and in my family and me Mm -hmm. being the middle kid. And, oh, that really helps me understand how I live and um, move and have my being even today.